Hi, this is Professor McLaughlin with a brief lecture on negligence, and this is from Chapter 6 in uh, Miners, The Legal Environment of Business. And there are, uh, this chapter is on torts, and there are three kinds of torts. There are intentional torts, negligent torts, um, and uh, strict liability torts. I'm going to lecture the most on negligence. Those torts are um, very frequent, very common, and I would argue that for most of you, those are the uh, cases um, that you will recognize the most. Uh, the Toyota um, accelerator case, um, the Johnson & Johnson talcum powder case, the McDonald's hot coffee case. These are all negligence cases. And um, and uh, they're also, uh, you know, if you f usually fender benders, um, any of those kinds of um, incidences or cases, most things that um, in another country, you might call an accident. In the U.S., we can sue for it. So this lecture will cover half of what Chapter 6 covers. Chapter 6 goes over negligence and intentional torts. Um, the intentional torts, uh, if I have time, I'll post another video. Um, but this is the one that I wanted uh, to get done and have you review before Assessment 1. So torts... Uh, as you remember from the earlier chapters, we um, the common law systems are based on uh, English law, but we do borrow words frequently uh, from civil law s systems like French. The, the word tort is a French word, and it's a civil wrong other than a breach of contract for which the law provides a remedy. So it is when we fail to live up to our legal duty that we owe to somebody else. And companies owe us legal duties. We owe legal duties to one another. Uh, much of what you do on the road, complying with motor vehicle laws, is fulfilling the legal duty that um, you have toward other citizens. You have legal duties on campus. You have legal duties in the classroom. Um, you have legal duties when you order your coffee from Starbucks. Um, and torts are occur when people breach those legal duties. And we really don't think of it in terms frequently of legal duties, but standing in line, waiting your turn, uh, alternate merge on the road, which nobody does in California, but allowing people in, um, allowing people to change lanes. Um, let me think of something that's not car related. Um, on campus, uh, not texting and walking so that you're dangerously going to run into somebody, uh, not walking down the sidewalk with a flamethrower. I mean, these are things we think are obvious, but they really are social values and standards that society impose on us. And when we fail to behave at a certain level, you might be subject to a lawsuit. So there are careless and even sometimes unintentional acts. Negligence is really where uh, you aren't necessarily intending to do something uh, careless, um, but when it happens, you might be subject to a lawsuit. So uh, each state has its own negligence, has its own tort law, and has its own negligence um, laws. They they don't vary that much. Um, negligence is a, a fundamental concept in U.S. law, but a punishment typically can vary by state. And what is a tort can vary by state. Torts allow us to compensate people for injuries that were wrongfully inflicted by a defendant. So it allows people to uh, be compensated if a product injures them, if a um, um, 
another individual injures them, if a doctor injures you, that's a negligence claim. And as I mentioned, the McDonald's hot coffee case uh, was, uh, it was negligence. And I think there was also an intentional infliction of emotional distress. But, but what we know of and what the jury uh, compensated uh, Stella Liebeck for was um, McDonald's negligently having the coffee too hot. So when you sue, what are you trying to get? You're trying to get what we call a remedy. You're trying to get, another word for that is damages. And typically, you're trying to get compensated for the harm and put in the position you would have been if the tort had never happened. So in the case of the hot coffee, uh, Stella Liebeck asked McDonald's to pay her extensive medical bills. She was rather severely burned. She had uh, third degree burns and she had many, many, many skin grafts. It was a very, very severe burn. Uh, and she asked Mon uh, McDonald's to pay for the $30,000 in medical expenses. And that would have, you know, it doesn't return your body to the position it would have been in if the harm had never happened. But but we kind of say that it does legally because it, it compensates you for lost wages, medical bills, um, those are the remedies. Uh, punitive damages, and let me adjust this a little bit. Punitive damages come from um, a U.S. legal concept that you, if something is very extreme, extremely reckless, that you allow compensation beyond what the plaintiff just suffered, beyond medical bills, and you allow a number, which is punitive, to tell the defendant, you know, don't do this again, and to help other defendants to understand that the law isn't going to allow this kind of uh, malicious or extremely reckless behavior to happen. Um, and if it does happen, uh, potentially you could pay the successive punitive damages. And what we remember from the McDonald's hot coffee case is that the punitive damages were, I, I think it was in the millions. Um, and uh, Mrs. Liebeck tried to settle with McDonald's multiple times, but it wasn't until the jury rendered a very large punitive damages award that McDonald's settled for a much smaller number. So as I mentioned, we have three categories of torts, negligence, which we're talking about in this video, intentional torts, and then strict liability. And strict liability is just super, super special. You have a pit bull, it bites a neighbor, or you are a business that transports explosives and something explodes and you hurt somebody. Um, very specific uh, types of fact scenarios will give rise to a tort in strict liability. Intentional torts are um, things like assault, intentional infliction of emotional distress, which uh, students feel sometimes and faculty feel sometimes as well. But these are things, these aren't accidents. You intended to do something and you did it and it caused harm. Businesses can experience all of these torts. Businesses can have animals that bite. Businesses can have uh, intentional acts that harm someone. And businesses can also uh, act with negligence or um, uh, carelessness. And this slide is just explaining the the possible factual situations. But McDonald's is a business tort um, case. It's a business negligence case. So negligence has four elements. It has an and uh this only shows three. Okay, so let's just say they have three according to this book. Um, th traditionally, 
it has four elements because we say a duty was owed and then the second element is a breach. But this has reduced it to three elements, which says one, there's been a breach of a duty owed. It has caused harm. Number two, it, there's a causal connection between the breach of the duty and the injury and there is in fact an injury. So if Stella Liebeck had just heard that McDonald's had hot coffee and then sued McDonald's without any actual injury, uh, McDonald's, there may be a breach, but there's no injury and no causal connection. Um, McDonald's, by having too hot a coffee, breached a duty owed all drinkers of McDonald's coffee. Um, but we need that causal connection and you need actual injury. Um, duty owed, breach of that duty, a causal connection, and then damages. And the reason we focus on causation is that um, you know, f frequently, uh, like for example, in the Toyota sudden accelerator case, or maybe a better example is the uh, VW when Volkswagen didn't put the emissions regulators or it altered the emissions regulators so it fooled US testing and uh, said that they were regulating emissions but they really weren't who did that besides being a violation of US law who, who was who could have potentially sued because they were damaged by that what what would be a causal connection and a harm between Volkswagen um, having uh, tampered with the emissions regulator or the indicator? And, you know, could the planet sue? Could everybody who inhaled fumes from those cars, would you count up the cars that were emitting above the standards? And then could you measure that kind of damage? That's why we look at causation. You really, that would be hard to prove. How do we prove that the um, smog created or the emissions emitted by those vehicles caused the harm to you because you inhaled it when you may have inhaled other smog or lived in a very smoggy place? So causation is important to prove because we don't want to just let anybody recover. We only want the law, uh, only wants those to be able to recover who suffered an actual harm. So the duty of care is a reasonable person standard. So uh, you only owe a duty that a reasonable person would owe. Um, you know, attorneys need to act like a reasonable attorney. Doctors need to act like a reasonable doctor. You don't, uh, there's no expectation that you need to be more perfect or that you need to be more careful. You're only liable for unreasonable acts and a reasonable person standard is really what society says. Uh, the reasonable doctor is the reasonable attorney and that is why in malpractice um, cases you'll get expert witnesses who are other attorneys or other doctors or other certified uh, public accountants to say you know what what would a experienced professional do so the I don't think that this isn't covered by chapter six but this is a great case it's a great example I think this is the only slide I have on it but the state of New York had a um, case where a four-year-old was riding on the sidewalk and um, ran into it. Uh, it was on a tricycle, ran into uh, an 80-year-old woman who fell, broke her hip, and eventually died from complications of a hip replacement surgery. And the older woman's estate sued the parents of the four-year-old, but also sued the four-year-old. And what this slide is meant to get you to think about is, you know, what is the reasonable four-year-old? Can you say that the four-year-old riding a tricycle who ran in to the woman on um, the sidewalk was acting unreasonable? Unreasonably, what is a reasonable four-year-old? Most would say that 
four-year-olds are not reasonable and that you couldn't put a reasonable person standard on that. And this is just to get you to think, you know, who can be sued? Who should we allow to be sued? Can children be sued? And remember, we're not talking about criminally, we're talking about civilly. Um, these are the kinds of questions that uh, when we look at the reasonable person standard, I want you to ponder. So let's talk about causation. We have two kinds of causation. We have cause in fact and proximate cause. And cause in fact says, if McDonald's had not made their coffee so ha hot, Stella Liebeck would not be injured. So we're looking for factual connections between, and it, it's called the but for case uh, test. So but for McDonald's making their coffee too hot, Stella Liebeck would not be injured. But we also want to ask a, a second question, or the law has created a second question to ask, which is proximate cause, which is really like, is really, I want you to think of it like legal cause. Okay, well, we know the McDonald's made its coffee too hot. It passes the cause and fact causation. But do we want to hold companies liable for this kind of negligent conduct? And um, in the state of Texas, they said, yeah, that is where uh, Stella Liebeck uh, won that case, and then it settled afterwards. So two kinds of causation, um, the actual cause, which is, you know, someone did A and, and uh, it caused harm to another person. One act caused harm to another person. And then we ask this question about proximate cause. Do we want people to be liable when they do A, when they commit this act? Do we want to have the law um, allow people to be compensated for that? And we ask questions like, you know, we ask questions like, was it foreseeable? Could McDonald's foresee that someone would be harmed if they had their coffee too hot. And here is the, I want you to take a look at that uh, Lego video I put in your module. Um, if, if this is uh, summer 2019 uh, students listening to this, uh, there is a case called, uh, Long, uh, it's Paul's Graph v. Long Island Railroad. And it is about a uh, person riding Long Island Railroad a long, 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 long time ago. But it helps def helps you think about concepts of foreseeability. What kind of harm should businesses foresee? Uh, should businesses now foresee, like if somebody's in Target and there's an earthquake and a product falls off of a shelf and hits them, is Target responsible for that? Without the earth moving, that item would never fall off the shelf. So is that foreseeable? Should Target now have nothing on high shelves? Should Target only have things on the ground? Because we'll, we may have an earthquake and somebody um, could be injured if it fell off. And things like this, chains of events, foreseeability, these are additional concepts and questions that the law asks and uh, ask questions you know, if events or possible events are too remote, it's very unlikely this would not would happen. There's no reason that a company would foresee that this would happen. Then there should be no liability. So what I'm really, oh, here's the Paul's Graph v. Long Island Railroad. You go, take a look at this slide. Um, I won't talk any more about it. I do want you to read the slides and also take a look at the video in your module in Canvas. There are always defenses to negligence actions. You could always say, I uh, may have done something wrong, but you did something wrong as well. We call that comparative negligence. Um, uh, let me think of a good example. If, um, I don't think of any bad ones where, well, I guess we could use Stella Liebeck. If Stella Liebeck had been, as people read, uh, driving without, um, 
driving no hands, driving with her knees, trying to put cream, go through the drive through trying to put cream in her coffee, and this is how she spilled the coffee. It's possible that a jury could have found that uh, McDonald's wasn't quite as negligent. Um, comparative negligence is just this idea that, well, an accident happened, but we want to make sure both that if, if there was negligence on both sides, then we reduce recovery by a percentage of negligence. We just don't let people act carelessly um, and frequently both parties are acting carelessly. And so the law takes a look at their levels of carelessness and reduces recovery based on that. And then on the left of your slide, this assumption of risk, think of you're going bungee jumping or you play flag, flag football or you, you're some kind of sport on the weekend, you injure yourself. Well, you knew the risk, you assumed the risk. You can't sue me now that you hurt yourself. Uh, and that is the end of this video. Um, I am not sure if I, if I will have time to post a, a um, video for the uh, intentional torts before your exam, uh, but make sure you review those slides and uh, read chapter six. Thank you.